about just a little bit and make this a bit more of a discussion that is uh, uh, less structured but still has structure so you're informed and we can share some of the background on where we come from what we see done in influencer marketing and some of the things we can share with you guys so you don't make the same mistakes or don't go into a campaign with some of the mindsets that perhaps are better off left behind. So without further ado, I'm going to jump in into a bit of, uh, of, I guess, talking about how I started with uh, influencer marketing. And let me know if you can see this behind my head. I think I have a pretty big head. Okay, good, good. So I started with influencer marketing in 2013 with my first endeavor in tech. And uh, it was a total uh, kind of you know, shot in the dark. Um, whatever I was using on Facebook and Twitter was not uh, ROI positive for me, and I was really scrambling. At the moment, I came to my boss and I said, give me $10,000, I have a really great idea. And he said, yeah, sure. So I went to this one influencer who some of you may or may not know. If you've ever played Clash Royale or Clash of Clans, he's a legend. His name is Chief Pat. So I got in touch with Chief Pat and I said, hey, I have a campaign in mind. Um, you know, how about connecting? So we connected and I ran a campaign with Chief Pat that was a CPI campaign. The results were mind blowing. So from there on, my boss came to me and he said, okay, take all the budget and do your thing. Um, it was a little bit scary because the budget was big and I all of a sudden was looking in the eye of my manager who was expecting a lot. And you know, we continued on to scale. So for about a year after that, we ran purely CPI campaigns, which was fantastic. But the landscape started to change. Um, a little bit after we uh, onboarded about three dozen influencers, we realized that brands are catching on and they're coming in and they're paying flat fees and they're paying on CPM. Um, they're paying for posts on Twitter and posts on Facebook. So I all of a sudden was not competitive whatsoever. So we started running blended campaigns where we paid influencers um, a small fee to feature our brand on their channel, uh, sort of like a, a salary every month. And then we also paid them on performance. So they had very little to lose if all else fails and a lot to gain if things worked out. So I carried on on that structure uh, for a while and uh, we continued to scale with influencers. And then the landscape continued to change yet again as more and more brands, bigger brands, started coming in and pouring in even larger budgets and all of a sudden word CPI became like, whoa, CPI? I don't want that. I want them flat fees, right? So we had to change and one of the beauties of tech and one of the beauties of, of gaming, right, is that if you look at the history, it, it, it changes, right? And you just have to catch up and adapt. So we basically started working uh, on multiple other models. Of course, flat fee became the strongest because you're more competitive with the uh, brands and marketers that were bidding on flat fees. But we started looking at it and saying, but how can we bring value to the influencer and the advertiser, whether it's a game developer or a marketer? At that point, I uh, left the company that I started with and uh, joined Rooster, which was later acquired by Chartboost. So we started looking at how can we bridge the gap in technology, bring the value to the influencer, and bring the value to the advertiser. And in that sense, you know, that's kind of how we arrived at being here today, having Alfredo here to tell you a little bit more about where do we see these things going forward? You know, how is the future uh, folding, you know, uh, looking to be, um, you know, coming together? So Alfredo, new experience. I know that when you started um, in gaming, that was a while back. So have you seen very similar trends, you know, since you've been working with influencers to where all of a sudden CPI became a dirty word and flat fee was a holy grail? Certainly, and uh, basically for us, um, you know, prior to this, I was at Kick9 Games where I was co-founder, and the, the model for us is very much the same. We're looking to bring games from the east to the west, so games that were fairly popular in Asia, and then localizing these games for the uh, US market. And then basically a point of difference for us is you know, we wanted to find a way to capture um, you know, audiences, and basically we found that you know, influencers were a great way to you know, gain additional exposure for your brand and you know, essentially drive installs. So um, taking place in 2014, you know, we did see more of a CPI-based uh, uh, you know, kind of campaigns that were getting off the ground. And for us, you know, that was great because it was much like a traditional UA campaign. Um, and you know, it was uh, something that we were able to do and track uh, essentially these campaigns and see how certain influencers backed out for us. 
And, uh, and basically throughout the years, you know, we were uh, utilizing influencers more on a CPI based models and then slowly the market did trend, uh, change as Elena mentioned. And we basically went more to like a flat fee based campaigns and traditionally right now, a majority of our campaigns are flat fee based. That's right, and I think there's, a, there's still a body of, uh, of marketers that are very much performance driven, so what we always try to talk about is um, just changing the mindset, and I think I'll say it maybe one too many times during this uh, fireside chat, but that's really important, and we'll go into details in a bit. Um, but one of the things that I'll better just mention is that there is scale that you can capitalize on by going to influencers uh, just between YouTube and Twitch where there is most of the impressions that are driven for brands. Um, the numbers are astonishing. Uh, Google published their new uh, data just a few months back and Twitch has aggregated some of the data and just to see uh, currently how many you know, 18 to 49 year olds are on YouTube, 8 out of 10. That is a crazy number, right? And then how many of them come on mobile, so this statistics was published by YouTube just recently, one billion views per day come from mobile. Regardless of whether your brand or your game or even if you're a PC developer, right, people are on the go and they're watching YouTube. Whatever it is that they're watching, there is a chance to present them with you know, information on your brand, on your game, and deliver value to your brand through that. And uh, one of the other stats that always blows me away is that 144 billions of gaming videos are watched monthly. I sat down with my, uh, my partner in crime here at Turbust Influence, Dylan, and we were like, Dylan, let's, let's do some math. How many days is that? How many people in the world are watching this? And do they, got, do they have nothing else to do? But right. I mean, I will say this myself, I spend a lot of time watching strategy on YouTube, so I contribute to this number greatly, so let's just... Let's move on. Um, one of the things that I talk to my uh, clients about is that uh, while the landscape of, uh, you know, of influencers is changing, a uh, landscape of user acquisition channels is changing, people are growing more and more blind. You know, we see ads everywhere. We are exposed to them from the moment we wake up. Uh, change the weather app or check the weather app, you know, we get on subway or board, we come to work, we watch YouTube, watch TV, etc. We see lots of ads and people become more and more, you know, uh, blind, you know, to those ads, right? So I talk about going somewhere where you get very authentic uh, content all the time and one of the things that Alfredo and I were talking about right as I reached out to him to invite him to this conversation is that he always looks for somebody authentic. And Alfredo, can you tell us just a little bit more about you know, what it is that you look for uh, in not just a particular you know, integration with an influencer, but when you think of influencer marketing, why is it that you put some stock into it due to the authenticity of a content? Certainly, and uh, basically for us, uh, like our approach is you know, this influencer essentially build their own brand. And they have their own audience, and um, they, they've captured you know this audience in a way uh, where you want to match it with your audience. So basically, you know, uh, let's say your game has more of a humorous aspect to it. Maybe you're looking for you know an influencer that can kind of play on that. Uh, so essentially, you're looking to basically uh, find an influencer who can you know work with you very well. Uh, essentially, show your game in a light that matches your brand, uh, and essentially, it creates a win-win scenario between the two. Definitely. And the other thing too is that right now there are so many platforms where influencers are active. I mean, raise your hand if you have an Instagram. <laughs> if yeah. you have a Snapchat. If you use Facebook. You watch oh. videos on YouTube. If you watch streams on Twitch. So <laughs> that, all of us. that right there, right? I mean, yeah. there are so many various ways that you can reach your uh, you know, potential audience. and. The behavior of the end user is very different, right? Um, I mean, oftentimes I scroll, scroll through the video just to get to that one part where Chief Bat shows me how to use a Sparky, right? And I move on to the next channel, or you know, I'll go on Instagram and I'll I'll scroll. But you want to find the influencer who's got such authentic voice that regardless of where it is that you go to connect with them, whether it's their Instagram page, their YouTube to watch the VODs or you know to follow their adventures while they're streaming themselves, you know, explore the uh, jungles of Amazonian for the first time. You want to make sure that the end user consumes the content in a way that will bring you value mm -hmm. because otherwise you're sort of 
campaign just to put your name out there, right? So people's behavior on mobile, on platforms, on social platforms is so different today than it was a few years ago. So just keep that in mind too. And one of the things that um, we talk quite a bit with Alfredo uh, about when we connect about campaigns. So uh, Alfredo and I are currently working on one of the campaigns for their newest titles is, uh, you know, finding places where integrations will mean the most, right? So the games that they create could be played on mobile, they could be viewed as VODs uh, on YouTube, they could be viewed as streams on Twitch. Uh, so we looked at some curious statistics from Twitch and they shared this just a few months ago that one million views are dedicated to views, uh, to streams on Twitch every week. So use that, combine that with the power of YouTube and you have yourself a medium where you can reach a whole lot of users that may mean, you know, make it or break it for your brand. So I'm gonna kind of hand it over to Alfredo a little bit because we wanna hear from him on what it is that he does at NetEase and how he sees influencer marketing, what they do to uh, integrate with that and sort of what the future holds for them. Uh, yes, yeah, so for, basically for us, you know, when looking uh, from measuring success to building audiences, uh, we kind of look at them in terms of like different tiers. Uh, so the very first tier for us would be essentially looking at this person as a brand ambassador. And you know, what we hit on a little bit earlier is, again, you know, you're partnering with someone who's gonna represent your brand. You wanna find someone who's gonna you know, put your game in the best light, you know, say positive things about your title. Um, and if your game is you know, so high polished and very coveted, you, know, you can bet that they're gonna say great things about it, which is, which is a, a good thing. Um, so you know, basically, uh, as we hit on, you, know, you wanna find someone who essentially matches your title. So look at their demographics. If you have an RPG, you know, typically this would be a male 18 to 34 years old. Um, if, you're, if you have a UA strategy, for example, and you're targeting North America, make sure that you know, their geos are North America uh, heavy. Um, and then again, um, you know, also pick you know, how many influencers you're seeking to cooperate during this campaign. Uh, maybe you're looking for one large voice, maybe one large influencer with a huge subscriber base, and this can be your kind of almost um, like mascot for your title. Or perhaps you're looking for a broader approach where you're looking to partner with maybe over a dozen or so for an initial launch. Uh, so that, that would be basically the first tier. Um, and then basically we're looking for the second tier. Um, you know, this is kind of a form of user acquisition. And how you bundle it uh, for your campaign uh, depends on your marketing strategy. Um, basically, like for a NetEase games, uh, we see it as kind of a, like a holistic approach in a way where basically we can utilize um, a key piece of asset created by influencers across different marketing channels. So say, you know, an influencer makes a, you know, a really a great video about, hey, this is how the game works. We can then use that video across PR, community, it's a user acquisition asset. Um, additionally, it's something we can use on the web. Uh, so that's you know, something you can, it's not traditional UA, you can use it as traditional UA, but you can kind of look to use it in a few different areas. Alfredo, one of the things you just mentioned is that when you're going and looking for an influencer in certain geos, uh, you have to make sure that that's where most of the viewers are coming from. We actually recently ran a campaign where Alfredo's team launched a new server in PSD, so uh, luckily YouTube is really fantastic at gaining analytics and insight into the channel, so when we were connecting, we were looking in particular not just for the channels who have a great amount of viewers coming from North America, but also those that come from California or in general just PSD, right? Because we wanted to make sure that at the time of the launch, uh, as many people come to the uh, PSD server as possible. So um, just understand that you know there are various uh, analytic keys, uh, key tools that you can be using to uh, gain a better understanding into who it is that you're going after, and uh, that'll help you to uh, better divide your budgets uh, and come up with a better strategy. Definitely, and I'll move on to the next tier, which is uh, basically SEO, search engine optimization on the, on the prior side. Um, essentially, you know, think of this as you know, uh, kind of, you know, when you go to Google, when you go to Yahoo, you know, people are gonna be looking for your title. Um, so when you're working with an influencer, if you have your game's title in the game description or in the title of the video, uh, for new game launches and soft launches, they can be very crucial. So think, you know, someone's going to Google, they're typing in your name, the very first videos that appear are gonna be these videos that influencers created. So basically you want these videos to be, you know, traditionally very high quality that represent your game 
game well so that when um, very early users are finding them, they can learn very quickly what this game's about and uh, basically transition to downloading them. Um, and then lastly is the kind of the long tail video creation um, aspect of this. So you're going to be working with certain influencers who maybe initially you're you know, working with them on a, on a paid basis. But you know, what you may find is that they become super fans of your game. Um, so after that initial payment, they're going to be continuing to create new content for you uh, just because this game is helping to build their audience. Um, it's, it's kind of a win-win case there as well. Yeah, I think last year when we had this talk, we were talking about one of our poster childs uh, who created a one-time paid integration for a partner. And uh, that was, the talk was held last year, and he's still going. Right now, he's over 100 videos in, and he was only paid for one of them. That is an ideal situation, and every developer hopes to be that developer to create this you know, incredibly long-lasting relationship. But what I can speak to is that you, know, you may not find somebody who will make 100 videos for you, but you may find somebody who will come back to you and say, you know, hey, Alfredo, I played this, and as a player who spent five years playing League of Legends professionally, I think you know, your game could benefit from X, Y, and Z improvements. Or you know, uh, I would love to host an event with my own audience. How do you feel about you know, me hosting a three hour stream that your team can moderate, right? And you just never know where this relationship goes. So be really open-minded and also be ready to uh, sometimes deal with personalities that are bigger than this room, right? And those are the personalities that drive value to your game because you know they didn't create these audiences, they didn't grow their presence online just because they were bland, right? And so uh, utilize that, utilize the fact that they will be uh, loud and colorful and, and, and big and, and vocal, right? And use that to your advantage. Um, another thing that I wanted to touch upon is that exactly what Alfredo was saying. In the beginning, it may be a paid feature, right? And uh, even if you're not getting to the point where you have an understanding that the influencer will make a series of 20 videos and the rest of them are going to be free, invest into a long-term relationship. If one thing that we've learned is that the idea of the fact that, oh, I had one video with a YouTuber and that's enough because the other one will be viewed by exact same uh, viewer base is not true. The YouTube is a, a very fast pace moving and change in place. The algorithm changes all the time. So just because somebody has made a video for your game does not mean that the second video will be viewed by the exact same person. It may not go out to exact same number of subscribers that are subscribed and enabled in notifications just because uh, you know, that's that's just how YouTube works, right? Uh, if somebody enabled a little bell as a YouTuber, I always say subscribe to my channel in the first couple of seconds of the video, which is a little annoying, and then you say enable notifications because you really want everybody to see your video. Uh, but sometimes people will subscribe but not enable notifications, which means that YouTube will use the best logic and they'll send them the video whenever they feel it's relevant and they don't want to overwhelm them. So uh, invest in a relationship with an influencer because that's when you get the best value uh, and they will continue build you up as you're building them up too. And um, as a, uh, something we wanted to kind of transition into is what it is that uh, Alfredo looks forward uh, to and looks for in an influencer and some of his tips when he uh, builds his strategy. So the first one is basically um, providing in-app purchase perks to the influencers. Uh, so essentially, like, you know, they want to get easy access to a lot of the high-level content. Um, so I think you know a lot of these people. Uh, this is their main business. This is a full-time job. You know they're investing hours each day to create you know uh, videos that they hope, hopefully you know help grow their audience. So uh, as a brand or you know as a developer or publisher, you know if you can pro provide any kind of like incentives to them, um, if let's say it's in-game currency, they can quickly level up. Let's say past level 30, uh, which saves them time. And then for you know new users playing the game, they can easily go see this content, see the high-level uh, content there, and want to download the game. So providing like any kind of you know basically uh, in-game items or. Uh, even uh, previews. Uh, so as an example, let's say your title, um, you know, you're maybe a few months ahead in the development process. If you can provide the influencer with, like, here's a, um, you know, um, upcoming build that's coming out, you know, please showcase this to your audience. Uh, and at some point, you know, uh, they will. And basically, this, this also provides them with, you know, content, or exclusive content that they cannot normally receive. But um, as an incentive, because they have this content, they're really, again, invested in the game. Um, if you keep providing these kinds of items to them, it, you're basically tying them to your game and they're helping you grow as well. Definitely. As a user, 
YouTuber and a gamer, I love getting those emails from games that I uh, play all the time anyway. And if, you know, if something new is coming up, uh, as a YouTuber, you grow your audience by uh, having that shock factor on YouTube, right? Or having access to content before anyone else does. So, you know, when you get an email saying, uh, you know, we have an update coming up, we'd love for you to play it and show it with your audience and tell them this is on dev build all of a sudden you become this little VIP on YouTube, right? And the viewers will then continue coming into your channel and uh, checking in with you because they hope that if something new is coming down the pike, you'll be the first person to tell them. And as a developer, it also helps you, uh, you know, to kind of encourage them to stay uh, connected with the game and not only just play it around the times when there are updates. Uh, so the next one would be representing the brand. Uh, basically, does a particular influencer represent your brand in an impactful and memorable way? Um, so again, it's you know providing those moments to influencers which they can showcase their content in, in a way that's uh, very unique for their audiences. So for us, uh, for Crusaders of Light, something I'll hit on a little bit later. Um, you know, we were uh, basically one of the first games to have you know 40 person raids you know, at your fingertips, um, basically being able to play with 40 players on mobile at the same time raiding the dungeon, which was, uh, you know, very interesting for us. And we had to basically determine a good way to position this content. Uh, so uh, we did work with Cheap Hat and Galanon Gaming. And one of the ways we did that is, you know, we had a very large, uh, basically, competition uh, where we had Fort Desolation Heroic Mode, which is this very difficult dungeon that, uh, you know, very few people can beat. Uh, because we tie this, you know, very large cash prize to um, this particular dungeon, we gave them two months to defeat uh, a dungeon, and then basically the winning team of 40 would, you know, would win the $400,000 prize, um, whoever got the fastest time during these two months. And basically, you know, because we had this very special moment we can share, we, we teamed up with Chief Pat and Galen on gaming, and they basically teamed up with the winning team and took them through all the content, you know, worked with this, um, with the winning team and said, hey, you know, what was your winning strategy? You know, how often did you practice? What were your tactics to take down the boss? Um, and these strategies, you know, were very useful to, for everyone to see post-launch. Because prior to this, basically, everyone just looking at the leaderboards, you know, who, you know, who's winning? All, all you can see is just the data, you know, this, this team's winning by a few seconds, but you don't really know what goes behind it. Um, by basically giving access to influencers to, you know, how some of these things work, they have a very, like, unique pitch for their audience, and basically, you know, they can see an event that wouldn't normally uh, be very easy to see. Prior to Alfredo um, becoming our full-time point of contact at NetEase, we worked with uh, his counterpart and uh, we ran a campaign for Eternal Arena, which is another big title uh, from NetEase. And uh, what we've done is we looked into a gaming house. Uh, those exist. Uh, it's like heaven for gamers, where you're surrounded by like-minded people that play the same game and you create together. And um, you know, we've sort of looked into uh, combining the power of influencers, right? And this is something that uh, Alfredo just touched upon for the $400,000 raid that they had. I mean, that is huge, right? And you take two personalities, Galadon and Chief Bat, which rumor has it Galadon is Chief Bat's dad. We think it's not true. Um, we know it's not true. But, uh, you know, we worked with a gaming house where we placed a video with one of the influencers, and then next thing we knew, we had a video of all five of them playing together uh, and just, allowing uh, you know, your influencers to come in and deliver on the value uh, that also engages the audience in a very unique way, all of a sudden it's not just another video of the same person playing a game by themselves, right? You have four other guys coming in, the combined energy is great, right? And uh, you benefit from that immensely. Definitely, and then staying with the, you know, basically combining the power. So, you know, when you're looking to basically partner with influencers, you know, you can basically, you know, talk to your local contact um, at Charboost, for example, or, you know, basically do a search on YouTube, so, you know, see which basically personalities are working together. You may find that, you know, uh, the exciting thing is when you're bringing these individuals to work on a particular campaign, they have like a synergy between them. There's a reason why these three are working together. So when they're playing like your content or another game, you get like a very, you know, great emotional rise out of these people. You know, basically they're showing you their emotion as they're playing along, you know, they're, they're making fun of like what's happening. And it really helps, you know, uh, as a user seeing that because you're, you're getting excited playing and you want to play. Um, kind of like the, the other aspect with that is if, you know, you're partnering with two or three videos or uh, influencers for that matter, you have three videos that are going to be going live around the same time. 
Um, so again, this is a little bit in the measurement aspect, but you know, let's say you have you know, traditional um, marketing activities going on, such as UA and PR. You may find that when you're going live with you know, three different videos from three different influencers that you're gonna see organic lift in the charts. So say, for in our case, we're in like, the role playing and strategy categories um, on the App Store. You know, looking back at our campaign, like over a five day period, we may see positive uplift, which is you know, very exciting for us as well. And going back to those combining the powers of influencers, sometimes they'll lead to really great like rivalry videos where you know three videos in they still need to set settle the score and you know it, it gets really fun. And um, one of the things too that we wanted to uh, continue to highlight through this presentation is what Alfredo was just talking about, right? You need to think about your KPIs in a creative way, right? So look at your organic uplift over time, right? Because the way that the tracking is done on various platforms may or may not be beneficial to you. Uh, sometimes the end user may have no incentive to actually click the tracking link and uh, they can just go to the store directly and download the game from there. Sometimes it may take them a little bit, you know, they may be at school or your file is really large and they need to be on the Wi-Fi but they'll come back and download later right so just rethink your KPIs don't just go into this with your traditional UA strategy uh, in mind you know you have to think creatively when you work with influencers because at the end of the day you know these are not robots these are not DSPs and uh, you know these are humans that are talking to millions of other humans every day uh, yeah, and basically now like I'll hit on just like Netty's games uh, North America, like what we're working on and kind of our approach. So the I think the largest one of the larger games that we recently launched was Crusaders of Light, which I mentioned throughout this presentation. Um, and basically for us, we launched in summer um, of the, uh, last year, and initially we were available on Google Play um, and the App Store. And you know, uh, basically one of the kind of objectives provided to us from management is just like, hey, you know, we know we're a unique MMO, but again, you know, how can we get our name out there? How can we build buzz in media? Uh, how, to, how can we get people excited about this game? Um, so you know, basically the product marketing team, we worked internally and we decided you know, um, a large competition was something that would potentially you know, uh, get a lot of eyes on us and you know, get people playing the game. Uh, so very quickly, you know, we worked with our legal team to essentially start this uh, kind of competition, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so we worked with Cheap Pad and got one on gaming post-launch, basically to recap everything that happened uh, during this competition. Um, and during that period, we had leaderboards, we had uh, PR and community kind of posting progress about how things were going, and their own uh, internal community team also often did videos about, you know, um, kind of the progress as well, how things were going. Uh, which led to us kind of going into the next aspect was we wanted to build something internally after learning about how to leverage influencers. We called it Netty's Rewards. So just like you know, many uh, traditional chains, um, like even uh, brick and mortar stores that have like you know, a rewards program for you know, interacting with their content, uh, we wanted to give users of our game the same kind of um, experience. So essentially, like, we have a monthly newsletter that goes out to our users. Uh, with you know information about our game, and uh, what we did is like basically in exchange for users opting into this newsletter, they will receive um, an in-game gift. And if so many people uh, opt in over a period of time, then they can unlock, unlock additional gifts. Uh, so for example, the first first gift maybe a ten dollar prize reward, um, and then over uh, several months that prize may double to twenty, and then eventually uh, maybe even uh, sixty um, over maybe a several uh, maybe eight months or so. So we have this uh, program that we, we created as a way of like a retention mechanism. And we would also provide these links to influencers and we can create a custom page uh, that we can give to each influencer. And, it, and basically for every user they drive, uh, you know, we can basically um, allocate it, we can uh, basically say it came from their particular campaign and measure the success over a long term period. Um, and then basically the other thing we wanted to do is besides the paid side, we noticed that we do have a lot of organic influencers who you know, came up out of the game uh, by themselves, who basically genuinely love our game. And it may be even their very first time uh, um, um, ever you know, doing a stream or creating a video for us. So in, uh, a few months ago, we noticed we had about 200 influencers um, outside of paid who created uh, videos for us. So we wanted to find a way to showcase their content. So if you go to basically crusadersalight.com, uh, you'll find that we created more or less like a, a voting structure where we pick uh, videos that we find to be very unique for Crusaders of Light. Uh, maybe they're showcasing uh, content that's you know very hardcore in the game. People don't know how to play this 
particular level or get to a particular dungeon, but by watching these users' videos, they can learn that strategy. And then basically we can pick videos and feature them across our different marketing channels um, of influencers who are creating for us uh, organically. And basically, and then we worked together very closely with Elena on our most recent campaign, which is basically um, around March 7th, we launched uh, on Steam, and we're also showcasing a new server. Um, so during that period, we worked with about four different influencers who did a pre-roll campaign for us, and you know they have their original content, which is uh, maybe an average of about 10 minutes, and they allocate about 30 seconds to us, and basically show, um, hey, Crusaders Light is coming to Steam, uh, we have the link in the description, they can click there and basically sign up uh, for this campaign, and we'll be notified when the game is live. And if they signed up for the new server, they would also get a new reward. Um, so that was very something very exciting that we got to work on internally. Um, and then basically moving forward, we see NetEase uh, rewards as kind of the base for a lot of our campaigns. Uh, we can basically create a tracking URL, kind of utilizing Apps Flyer, and then tie it to this rewards mechanism. And then we're going to have very consistent consistent spending on all um, kind of influencer campaigns moving forward. What was really exciting uh, to work on this March is the Steam launch uh, with Alfredo Steam. Um, I think uh, I cannot highlight enough um, as how smart of an idea it is to utilize every place where you can get your user, um, especially in a place, uh, or rather in the environment where there's such a stigma that these hardcore games are better played on PC. And uh, we've seen massive developers, you know, put lots of resources into making the game experience uh, just as comparable, you know, and convenient on your mobile devices. But overall, we've seen that, uh, you know, Steam is still really strong. So to see Netties to take the step and uh, kind of uh, wet their feet and see whether or not it's going to work out for them and allow our users to then uh, be on either mobile device or play the game, uh, you know, through uh, Steam was really quite interesting, which also brings us to the next point where this allows you to reach out to a whole different group of influencers because there are so many people that are uh, you know very PC snobby and uh, no matter how good mobile games are they will say well but I only play you know console or PC you know and don't don't reach out to me so uh, we kind of seen that we got a fresh a breath of fresh air by uh, going to them and saying hey you know this game is available on Android and uh, iOS and Steam, and all of a sudden, and Facebook game room, and yes, <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, we got people say, "Oh, tell me more." So uh, we're really excited to see where uh, Netties will take this. You know, um, we're excited to see more data that'll come from this launch. I know that right now, Fredo Steam is uh, crunching numbers, trying to see, uh, you know, where this is going to go. But this was very, very exciting, and we're overall starting to see a, a bit of an industry trend where some of the devel developers we work with have uh, games that are uh, truly cross-platform, and you can play it on any of your devices, uh, regardless of where you are. Go to that. Sure. So to kind of round this conversation and open up the floor for questions, we wanted to kind of reiterate again that um, you know there's certainly a value in going to influencers. However, when you do so, uh, you know be open-minded, uh, have your strategy ready, and uh, make sure that the KPIs that you're applying to these campaigns are not the same as the ones that you're applying to your traditional user acquisition networks because otherwise you will be uh, disappointed. And uh, you know, let's think about measuring differently. This is the impact, this is the value of bringing your brand to uh, huge, huge uh, influencers. And when I say disappointed, uh, don't take me the wrong way because uh, finding somebody who endorses your game on their massive channels and drives both installs and brand recognition is by no means disappointing. But when you are trying to hit an ROI positive campaign on a certain day, right, we have to keep in mind that optimization here is very different, right? That's why you have to work with companies that bring uh, technology to this to help you uh, minimize the uh, risk when you go to the market and work with influencers. And again, remember, these are brands that are representing your brands and bringing your uh, brand to the uh, end user, the viewer. I think I said brand too many times, didn't I? <laughs> and, and again, you know, the strategy is really important. Uh, so when we started working on the campaign with Alfredo, our conversation was uh, started really early on because you want to make sure that 
uh, you select the right channel. We um, at Turbust Influence have um, an ability to look into the analytics of the channel so that um, we mitigate all the risks, uh, you know, that have to deal with UA campaigns, right, uh, influencer campaigns. But you can minimize those by starting early, coming up with solid strategy, uh, iterating on it, and then uh, you know seeing what's working and continuing that direction, seeing what's not working, cutting the losses and moving on. And that's really quite important. I think lots of times people come to influencer marketing campaigns and they say, oh, that's exciting, let's do it, you know? And what's the plan? Well, let's spend, you know? But let's spend wisely. Let's uh, uh, come up with different ways of measuring. Uh, we've seen some of, uh, really great partners uh, like Pixonic and Plarium, uh, they do great things with influencer marketing and they're very open about the fact that they use different uh, KPIs for those campaigns and that's how they're successful. So let's, let's work on those together. And uh, um, lastly, uh, the uh, building relationships is what uh, Alfredo was talking about in terms of invest into your influencer. Yeah, and then uh, basically building uh, basically the relationships. It, it kind of goes both ways. And again, basically for us, we're looking at the basically the paid and the organic side. Um, so you know, I think for us lately, the, the challenge has always been on the organic side. Uh, we also have influencers who've created videos for us, but you know, after a certain period of time, maybe um, you know they feel like the game has you know they, they've reached where they can in the game and they and they lapse. Or, or maybe you know some of them have encountered a bug, and you know they said, okay, you know uh, it's taking too long, and they leave. Uh, so, kind of another way to look at it in terms of building relationships is, you know, have your community team involved, have your product marketing team involved. You know, you want to reach out to these individuals, find out like what's the health uh, of the game. You know, what do these users want, and maybe you know learn from them what changes you can make. And you know, at the end of the day, you know, you're always looking to bring these people back into your title. And you know, it goes back to what we said in early on, kind of tying it back to the brand ambassador. These people are brand ambassadors for your title. So you want to make sure that they're like basically abreast to like everything that's happening in your game, so that they can relay that to their community and keep it a very strong foundation for your title. Definitely, and I think uh, the last the last point is uh, grow your partners. And I think I've mentioned that before. As you invest into the influencer, they invest. Uh, it's sort of an investment you're making into yourself because if they're committed to your brand as they continue to grow, uh, because if one thing we've learned is that uh, influencers like to grow and to get more power on their social media uh, platforms, they will uh, bring the value back to you. The videos that they create remain on YouTube forever if that's the platform that you're using. The posts that they post, whether it's uh, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, remain there forever. So there is a long tail effect that Alfredo was talking about a little bit earlier. And uh, you know, don't be afraid to invest into somebody. Develop those relationships. Make sure that they're not a one-time relationship because that's where you will see the uh, overall value come in as the relationship continues to strengthen and grow. Uh, one-time video may be viewed as a little bit less authentic but seeing your uh, favorite YouTuber or Twitch streamer play the game times and over again makes you feel that, you know, maybe they're not doing this just for the paycheck because otherwise, you know, they would cash out and stop, right? So build that relationship, invest into them, and they'll invest back into your game. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much, both of you. I don't know if there are any questions. You guys talked about about many different insights, <laughs> right. but are there any questions in the audience? Yeah. So, what are some of the most common mistakes you see developers make when they first launch an influencer campaign, and how can they avoid those? Alfred, do you want to talk about your experience? <laughs> sure. Yeah, um, hello, yeah, there we go. Uh, so basically, I think the biggest issue is um, vetting. So I think sometimes, you know, when you're like uh, trying to get something out the door, you may, you know, work with maybe a dozen or even more, uh, maybe even 30 or so uh, influences at one time. So it may happen like where you have an aggressive goal, I'm looking to gain as much exposure as I can in a short time. Uh, maybe you may find that, hey, you know, I found someone that wasn't necessarily a match for my brand. In which cases, like, you know, uh, maybe they're more negative, maybe they're more critical about, you know, the, the way your game is in its current state. So they'll make those comments very early on in your title. Or again, it's, um, you know, as Elena hit on earlier, you know, there's different influencers who kind of found a way to build their brand. Uh, so maybe you may find that, um, you know, maybe they're using more profanity that works for their brand, but maybe it doesn't tie in with your company image. So uh, those are kind of very common mistakes that happen pretty often when you're looking to scale at a very early time. And I will add from 
my point of view, uh, the mistake that I see uh, companies make quite often, um, and something that was very applicable a few years ago, uh, a few years back when you looked for an influencer, you looked for the biggest guy and you uh, wanted to go for somebody who's got lots of subscribers. And while that number is still very strong, I think what we're seeing and the shift really is going in the direction of, uh, I'm going to go for somebody who drives views because uh, YouTube has changed, right? And so you have to go for somebody who doesn't just have a great number of subscribers, but also drives the views. Subscribers can be inactive. You may have gained all that audience when you were playing, you know, Ark Survival, and now you're playing PUBG, and they're just not interested, right? So look at the channels that are still driving strong performance and driving lots of impressions, because uh, otherwise you can pay a bit too much and not get the value in your investment. have one last question for Alfredo. <laughs> what are the gaps that you're seeing in the industry and where would you like to see influencer marketing and the tools around influencer marketing be in a year or two? Uh, I think for me, um, the only gap I would see is just in terms of the pricing model. So I, I think we're still in a, in a place right now where there's several different models like coexisting at the same time. Uh, so I think for you know maybe someone who's just jumping into you know influencer marketing, you may not know what's the best model to use or what's the most effective. Um, so I think you know maybe at some point there's going to be more of a consolidation in terms of what's the you know uh, the best means. I think that's kind of leaning more toward flat fee. Uh, I think you know for us on the product marketing end, we always prefer the CPI model just because it is a guarantee install and you know we're more safe in the long term. Uh, but I think uh, that's the, the largest challenge. And then I think the other thing in terms of tools uh, that we hit on earlier, I think right now we have the tracking mechanism. So we do have an idea of where um, the influencers are coming from if they click on the link, but we still have a lot of people who maybe are just searching in, uh, you know, in Google and, you know, or, or typing in your name in the App Store directly. Um, so it's a little bit harder for us to kind of, you know, associate some, uh, some of the influencers kind of um, influence or, you know, users driven to that specific campaign. So I think if there's a way to kind of, you know, get that loophole kind of closed, it would also help go a long way in showing the overall impact in um, these kinds of campaigns. Perfect. Thank you so much, both of you. A big round of applause.